everybody. I'm Levi Litvai from Central European University's Department of Political Science. And I am talking to, I'm going to mispronounce your name. You say it. Sevi Jebo. I'll tell you the pronunciation. <laughs> yeah, yes, I'm, I'm going to learn this one of these days. Uh, who is also from Central European University, is a PhD student. And uh, and we have come together to discuss a paper that Samir actually suggested we we throw on our syllabus. Uh, we have thought about we had illusions of inviting the author, though uh, he's <laughs> he's not the caliber of person you just email and and ask for for something like this. But maybe with the intervention of the rector and all that, we have we had illusions. I just didn't have time to set it up. But we want to talk about this paper nonetheless. This paper is Populism and the Economics of Globalization. And the paper is by Danny Rodrick, and it's published in the Journal of International Business Policy in 2018. So it's an economist talking about populism. So uh, where did this come from? Why did, why, did, why did you suggest this paper? So I suggested this paper because of uh, back in, 2016, when I was doing my MA at, at, at CEU, it was right before the US elections and Trump already had the, the Republican card. And, you know, people were thinking of like, oh yeah, how did this happen? What happened? And I was in a class on international political economy with uh, a former CEU PhD graduate, Zbigniew Tuchlewski. I may have mispronounced his name now. Uh, and he was the one who kind of exposed me to Roderick's writings and some of his arguments. And he was like, look, the answer in why people are voting for Trump might be in, in globalization and in this. Uh, and it was kind of a bit of that overall argument of kind of losers of globalization. But I do think that there is also uh, a bit of nuance there. Uh, I think this paper is definitely kind of, I'd say like a culmination of, of Roderick's thinking um, on, on, on kind of populism and, and, and its relationship with, uh, with economics. And it came, you know, later in the two years later, but uh, I think it's very good. I think it summarizes uh, that argument. And in a way, I think for our class, it exposes uh, us just to it a different perspective on, on, on the rise of populism and in particular uh, the left versus right uh, variants. Yeah, so uh, I, you know, I mean, my first impression when you said that was, yeah, really an economist and a business journal. Uh, and that is totally like exposing my biases. Like I don't like economists writing about populism because there's no, never anything good coming out of it. but. You know, I'm, I'm always like very supportive. My, my teaching assistant wants to do this. Yeah, of course, we need to be supporting of this. And I'm sure I'm sure he has a vision for this. So so I just said yes without even reading the paper. I said, yes, let's put this let's put this on there. And I was reading the paper right before our conversation. And I, and I was thinking, this, this is really good. Like this is <laughs> this is a really good paper. I really love it. Uh, which has never really happened with uh, with uh, when I've seen uh, economists trying to study populism and uh, and uh, everything evolving in conversations of uh, econometrics and endogeneity correction and all that because that's usually what it what it does and the definitions are vague and uh, and and off usually so uh, so so thank you <laughs> thank you for showing me a great piece coming from economics. <laughs> All right, so what do you think, uh, based on this, what do you think economics can teach us about populism? Well, I, I think that Roderick's kind of argument is, look, you know, there's this thing, hap you know, happening, and it's not like we couldn't foresee that there would be a backlash to uh, globalization and the changing, you know, dynamics of the world, but let's look at kind of economic theory because there might be an explanation there uh, that will help us understand why it's manifesting itself in this particular way of populism and why is there uh, just a lot of um, demand for it and why is there support for those who supply it. Um, I, I also think that the way you, you kind of like looking at cleavages that are being created 
uh, by kind of the constant economic changes and economic development caused by the globalization is quite a compelling um, argument uh, to understand um, the differences between a right wing and, and why we in certain places we have a right wing uh, predominance of right wing populism and in other places we have a predominance of, uh, of left wing populism. And I, I don't think obviously, you know, you can explain everything about populism by using economics and economic theory, um, economic history, but I think it supplements what we know uh, in a really well and, and, and an innovative, uh, innovative way. Yeah, I, I think, you know, my general disposition is I don't think we can explain everything with anything. So, so, so I don't <laughs> think that's the, that's, the, uh, that's the bar we should put economics to, because that's, that's very unfair. Though, I mean, okay, so there's some compelling arguments here. So, so the first thing it looks at, the article looks at, or, uh, or Danny Roderick looks at is trade liberalization. Right. Yeah. And this is basically, I think he tries to explain in, in a very simple way, and uh, yeah. I'll try to do the same, not an economist, but I think uh, the basics of it, if we take kind of two, you know, maybe the most interesting examples here would be uh, United States and, and China, and which are clearly uh, economic actors or countries, whatever way you want to uh, describe them. Uh, or have different endowments. The US is very kind of like capital uh, intensive economy, but uh, it's kind of lacking, relatively capital intensive, but lacking uh, uh, kind of some of the labor endowments. China on the other hand is the reverse of that. It, it was kind of lacking in capital, but it was, uh, it had plenty of labor. Um, and when you open up, uh, when you kind of liberalize trade and allow these countries to trade uh, between each other, they get to focus on what they do uh, best. And when you remove trade barriers and tariffs and all of the other things uh, that ma they're making this trade between these countries um, harder, then what will happen is that each country will just start to focus on what they do best. So capital, the price of capital is going to uh, kind of go up in the States and uh, while the price of labor is going to um, go down. In China, labor is going to go up, capital is going to go down, and what this creates then from the standpoint of labor in the United States, this is really not good for them. Initially, it may be good because the whole economic pie uh, is going to expand, so everyone will be better off, right? Both the capital and the labor because we're just having more efficient economy. But as globalization goes kind of like further and further, uh, there's just no space to expand that pie anymore. And uh, whatever gains are being made, they're just mostly going to the, uh, to the owners of capital, um, creating then, you know, uh, the only way to kind of share this, share the gains would be to redistribute them, uh, creating a need for better redistributive uh, policies. And I think that's kind of the, the crux of what happens when trade is liberalized and countries get to freely uh, just trade with each other uh, and try to increase their overall economic efficiency. I mean, before we get to what, what like redistribution could or should look like, uh, one of the things that really struck me in the argument over here is, uh, is um, he cites a lot of empirical studies on um, how much that pie is actually expanding. And the numbers presented were shocking. They're, they're shockingly small. Like, like I've, I've, I've been buying into the, this, this, this notion of, of uh, free trade is good because it makes the pie increase, but it only makes it increase that much. That, that's pretty shocking. And uh, that was put into contrast with, um, uh, in contrast of of just the, you, you, I mean, I mean, it, it was actually quite specifically derived that there's going to be losers within each country as trade is liberalized. Who those losers are, 
is going to depend on on where you're at, what you're doing, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, that was nicely laid out. But but um, but I think the arguments that were made is that is is that the losers are going to lose big. And the winners are going to win big, but the losers are going to lose big. And uh, and if that's put in the context of a very, very mildly increasing pie, then the problems that are caused by the inequalities produced in the process may actually be more than the benefits of the little expansion. Uh, at least I I thought so based on the numbers uh, that that he presented based on the empirical studies. So I mean, this was this was very striking to me because this was the the first time I have reconsidered that maybe a growing pie costs too much, and uh, and uh, this is very nicely laid out there. So now, of course, you mentioned some kind of redistribution as a potential uh, potential solution for this. And uh, people might already expect that this doesn't work very well in the United States, for example. It might work a little bit better elsewhere. Um, I don't know what should what should we hit on on this point. Well, yeah, I, I think what you're saying is very very true. I, they did, you know, he cites some very cool uh, studies that people did on kind of like how how little of a benefit NAFTA. Uh, really provides to kind of like the labor in the in in the U.S. and just increasing of the of the pie, kind of a similar thing with the, with the trade with with China. And I think, and we'll hit this kind of later in the conclusion. Is I one of the questions that it makes you ask is, you know, is it really worth it? Like m- yeah. maybe we should just cap this uh, trade liberalization at some point because we are going to go into a territory where. Uh, you know, the, the somehow like the negative consequences, you know, will outweigh the, the benefits. I mean, one way to, to you know, uh, rectify some of these um, negative consequences is obviously through uh, redistribution. Uh, and some of the gains that are, that are made need to be redistributed kind of uh, all the sectors of, of, of society, so everyone would, uh, would, would, would benefit. Obviously, that's a problem, like you said, in the United States where tax, taxation is kind of a very touchy and a sensitive, uh, sensitive subject. Also, the, the welfare system is also a very touchy and sensitive system. conversation. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think that what was done in the United States is usually uh, policymakers would talk about this when they were preparing to enact reforms uh, that would liberalize the trade even more. And they would say, all right, don't, you know, don't worry. We have all of these measures in there that we are going to do to make sure we just redistribute the wealth and compensate those who are going to lose by these moves. Um, but once these reforms are passed, no one cares anymore. So like, they don't really go back and actually implement what, what they promised uh, because they have no incentive to. Um, yeah, so, so one of the one of the arguments of the paper is that this works better when there is an existing welfare system that will actually effectively deal with this without needing to implement any policy changes, which once again is not the case in the United States. In the United States, like uh, when... Uh, uh, let's just give the example of green jobs uh, when when there was conversation about how like the coal jobs need to become green jobs and there, there, there had to be all sorts of conversations about retraining and and I mean your average person doesn't want to be retrained number one number two the retraining never came because it was one of these post yep. <laughs> Post things that should have been implemented later and just wasn't so or wasn't effectively done so yeah yeah and and kind of directly related to this and the welfare system what what Roderick correctly points out is the populist backlash in in Europe is not one that's asking for protectionism Uh, Mm -hmm. it's one that kind of targets Brussels targets EU for the intrusion into domestic politics. Uh, but, you know, no one in Europe, no populists in Europe are really blaming um, 
China for like their trade practices. You know, Mexico obviously is, is far, but what I'm trying to illustrate is that there's there isn't a demand or there nor there is a supply of that sort of protectionist uh, discourse. I mean, Brexit again, another example that we kind of often relate to populist uh, to populism really was almost the reverse, right? Some of the motivation for Brexit was like, well, when we get out of the EU, we'll have even more free trade because that's that's what we want. We want to, you know, have even more free trade than EU is is allowing us. Uh, this, you know, on the other hand, it's not like they want to liberalize and, and open the economy to everything because I think part of what Brexit was was also just an opposition to uh, free movement of labor. Um, yes. But, you know, in terms of free trade, there was the sense among people who supported Brexit that EU is imposing all of these rules, um, you know, that we could just scrap and we could trade even more. We want to trade with everyone. Um, mm -hmm. So it's interesting. And part of the reason why this is happening in Europe, like, you know, uh, Roderick's argument is that Europe has a much more robust tradition of uh, a welfare state, that uh, there is more uh, redistribution and it's not necessarily even a contentious uh, issue in these political systems and, 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 and societies. Mm -hmm. yeah. One oh. thing that's, yeah. yeah, I was just going to quickly say, one thing that's particularly interesting about that is that, uh, Part of the populist backlash in, in, in Europe is, is coming against um, immigrants and, and refugees. And some of the fears there are is that these newcomers are going to erode this system, this welfare system, because mm -hmm. uh, they're going to unjustly get the benefits of it, you know, or they place an undue burden on it. Yeah, no, I, I was actually just going to say that that when you think of what could be blamed for a lack of our job security, I mean, trade is not necessarily the first one that comes to mind intuitively, right? I mean, if you think about it, yes, but 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 you know, automation is one of them. Where where the low skilled jobs are being replaced by by very high skilled uh, jobs that operate the automation. Uh, immigrants, of course, are, are are another who are willing to take the low the the low pay jobs. That's going to keep wages down, and and uh, you know they're coming for your jobs. This is definitely very central in Brexit. It's very central in in the argument of uh, let's build a wall on the border of Mexico and have Mexico pay for it. So in that argument, it's it's very it's very uh, very prevalent as well. Um, trade is not necessarily the first thing that comes to mind, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, when, when you think about it, I think, and empirically, more people are, you know, losing their jobs, more people are likely to lose their jobs because of automation. Mm -hmm. But politically, you don't mobilize as many people arguing against technology or, you know, blaming robots for, for anything. So, you know, when you have foreigners who can be a convenient scapegoat, that's just what you know. The the from the, from the from the supply side, that's what they go for, and that's who they frame as uh, the the actors to blame for you know job losses, wage decreases, wage stagnation, because it's a much more convenient um, uh, scapegoat. And yeah. I mean, historically, there's been mobilizations against technology. I, I don't think it would work today, but I mean, the Luddites are, have, that's, that's where the term comes from, is uh, um, I believe it's uh, its uh, something like throwing some, uh, some maybe, maybe shoe or some kind of thing into the machines to break them. <laughs> that's where it comes from historically. So, uh, so it's been, it's been known to happen, but uh, Today, mobilizing against technology, which is mainly manifest in your iPhone, which everybody's like tied to, it, it maybe it's not the winner, right? Yeah, I mean, and, and part of it is just that people people are kind of more mad about some of the unfair practices 
that they deem are un unfair and, to, and that come with trade liberalization. Uh, you know, if Roderick has this kind of like interesting uh, part in the paper where he presents, I think, four possibilities where one would get a competitive advantage uh, over, over another. And what he kind of correctly points out, not a lot of people are going to be mad if a company goes and just finds a better supplier somewhere in Germany yeah. and has an advantage. But people will be mad if they just outsource their work, uh, you know, to a developing country where uh, they're probably going to force the people to work 12 hours for very, very, you know, minimal pay because people perceive this as as cheating and it's not unfair and that's what uh that's what gets in a way people going and rallying and that's what they want to um uh, fight against i think this is a good segue that um you know trade liberalization is not just the only thing that uh, that Roderick pointed out as as uh as informative for understanding populism from an economics point of view. The other thing that uh, is, is, uh, is maybe a little bit more surprising is uh, financial globalization. So what's, uh, what's, be, what's behind that uh, issue? Yeah, I mean, financial globalization is an even more problematic. You know, if you were kind of on the fence uh, about trade liberalization, financial globalization, uh, is just even more tricky. And I think, you know, even for economists, uh, like a lot of them really don't see as many uh, benefits as we may kind of perceive that, that, that come from it. Um, in terms of this particular dynamic of kind of being bad for, uh, uh, for labor, it, it, it's problematic because it gives uh, more bargaining power to, uh, to the owners of capital, you know, mm -hmm. if, and it weakens the bargaining power of, of organized labor. If you are demanding, you know, higher wages, the owner of capital can just say, look, if you're not ready to work for this much, I'm just going to move all my production to, to China or some other place. And, you know, that's it because of this financial uh, kind of liberalization. Uh, another thing that it's kind of notorious with scandals that we have like Panama Papers and, and similar stuff is taxation because yeah. of this kind of free movement of, of finances and capital. It, it's very hard to, to tax. It's getting harder and harder to tax people who have the means uh, and the, in, you know, uh, all of their ingenious ways of, of, of avoiding taxation. So in a way, not only is the government losing on, on those tax dollars, they have to, in a way, prioritize and just focus uh, and get the bulk of their tax dollars uh, from, you know, people who are pretty static, people who don't have the option of changing where they live, who don't have uh, the opportunity to kind of hire incredibly creative accountants that will hide their assets and, and their wealth and it creates even more of a burden on uh, on them just kind of reducing even that kind of uh, possibility of a better uh, redistrib redistribution yeah so effectively we are uh, producing a regressive tax system where uh, the people with the less money pay more <laughs> So that's the yeah. opposite of the redistribution that is called for to correct for the the, the failures that come from um, from um, yeah from trade liberalization, for example, that we already discussed. So so yeah, all right. So so how does this um, how, how do all these economic predictions and empirics uh, manifest in terms of uh, of uh, who's going to be populist, and uh, both on the uh, supply and demand side, on you know, on the mass level and on the on the political level. So, um, what's the yeah. what's the political manifestation of all this? Exactly. After this long-winded intro, <laughs> yes. we finally get to uh, we get to the populism yeah. part and the political part. Well, it, yeah. obviously, all of these kind of economic changes, economic movements, they create anxiety, they create uncertainty, discontent, uh, 
just loss of legitimacy, feelings of kind of like an uh, unfairness of the uh, of the system, and th those exist. But what happens then is obviously the political actors are the ones who get to frame these. So, you know, these are just kind of, let's say, roots that are there for, for political mobilization, but then what happens with them is on the decision of the, of the, of the you know, supply side, because they are the ones who are going to be able to explain all of this uh, to the demand side. Uh, so where they'll be like, you know, this is what is happening uh, and this is why and this is who, who to blame. This is whose fault it is. And this is, uh, you know, what matters then is what sort of kind of cleavages or what sort of um, uh, things exist in a particular society or a country that are ripe for kind of... Uh, almost like exploitation by, by, by politicians. Uh, so if a country is, um, you know, if globalization has caused uh, a country or a society to have, uh, you know, movement of labor where you have a lot of foreigners coming in, uh, if it's caused certain types of, of jobs to uh, move, uh, you know, out of the country somewhere else, then what you tend to have, according to Rodic, is uh, you have this right-wing populism, which tends to be uh, xenophobic. Um, and, you know, a lot of the time tends to be uh, protectionist and the backlash can, you know, take even racist overtones. Um, on the other hand, what you may have, and this is kind of what's been happening in Europe and North America, on the other hand, what you may have uh, in places like Latin America, where globalization has had a different impact in that it has made the economy very kind of sensitive to these uh, boom and bust cycles, uh, where there's been a lot of just kind of uh, devastating economic uh, crisis, where there wasn't a lot of control in terms of foreign companies, just uh, foreign corporations coming in, buying the you know the local assets, changing uh, the rules of the game uh, for people working there. Now there, there's a lot of obviously anger um, towards uh, you know five international financial corporations, uh, kind of like countries that have been synonymous with this. Uh, new system of, of, you know, free trade, globalization. Um, and you have a lot of backlash against those domestic forces that are seen as helping uh, those that are propagating, you know, uh, this globalized, uh, uh, globalized system. And I think this distinction that you're already laying out is, is answering the question of, uh, where will populism manifest itself as a as a left wing phenomenon? Where will populism manifest itself as a right wing phenomenon? So, so what you mentioned with Latin America, this uh, this backlash against the international organizations that uh, that uh, you know break down protectionist policies and etc. Their their populism will be left wing, right? Um, yeah. How, how does this how does this manifest in Europe and uh, the United States with left wing populism? What would, what would you say? I mean, the U.S. has the U.S. is kind of a, a unique case that that has both, right? It has yeah. the populism of Donald Trump, wh who you know, which is very protectionist. It's very cultural. It's very um, ethno national. Uh, but you also have the populism of Bernie Sanders, which is very much concerned about uh, inequality, which is very much concerned about uh, shady financial institutions and practices uh, and, and corporations. Uh, in Europe, it's, a, it's another like very interesting case if you look at kind of country by country that uh, a lot of, you know, I think most of Europe has 
that kind of populism that's more similar to Donald Trump, which is kind of like an ethno-nationalist cultural populism because uh, of kind of like l lots of uh, um, immigration um, in a way and lots of kind of like certain jobs moving out. Uh, but if you look at countries that don't necessarily have the experience of increased immigration from the from the outside, like uh, Greece, Roderick specifically mentions Greece and, and Spain. Mm -hmm. These are the countries that have very strong leftist populist uh, movements because they were very much similar to the economies of Latin um, America, where uh, the kind of like the adoption of euro made them uh, again very sensitive to boom and bust uh, cycles when you know hence when the 2008 economic crisis uh, happened these countries uh, were just in, in terrible terrible crisis which spawned in a way very strong uh, leftist uh, populist movements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what, one of the problems with the adoption of the euro is, is you take away a country's ability to to uh, influence the money supply and 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 use those monetary tools to deal with financial crisis. So, so the crisis hit these places a lot harder uh, because they were already in bad condition, but they didn't have the tools at their disposal to counter the crisis in a way to cushion the crisis a little bit. Through uh, through monetary policy because the monetary policy was uh, was governed out of uh, Frankfurt and, and the European Central Bank and uh, not necessarily with the interest of these uh, economically um, less well off countries. So so if you look at uh, uh, Portugal, I mean Portugal is an odd case, but but if you look at Spain. Uh, maybe even Italy uh, with the Five Star Movement is not exactly a left leftist populist kind of, uh, movement, but 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 it's also not exactly right wing populist either. Uh, and Greece with Syriza, it's uh, this is the place where they emerged because they were, they were suffering from the same kinds of problems Latin America did with trade liberalization at the time. So so. Uh, so yeah, I thought that was uh, that was a very interesting observation of, uh, of 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 the article. All right, so how do we how do we fix this problem? Uh, what's what's the solution? Yeah, well, I think part of it is uh, what you were just saying. You know, we have to stop thinking that we can govern. You know, Athens from from Frankfurt. We have to stop trying to you know govern places from these global institutions and centers and you know trade liberalization obviously has its benefits but certain powers should remain with 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 national governments and certain sort of uh, flexibility should be given um, to them so they can properly respond uh, when when the crisis uh, happens so they can properly plan for or for those uh, crisis. So I think a shift from, you know, uh, a shift from global governance to a more uh, national governance is, is one thing that, that Roderick is, is, is proposing. Another thing that he's proposing well, let, is... Let me, let me stop you right there. So yeah. let me throw you a curveball. But doesn't that mean that the euro was a horrible idea? And well, wasn't Thatcher uh, right? Was isn't the UK right to 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 want to be out of the European Union? Because that's the implication to some extent, right? Yeah, I mean, like the, perhaps probably the reason why the UK never agreed to it. You know, if yeah, you go and ask course, the Greeks, they will probably they will probably agree with you. You know, they would probably wish mm -hmm. they they haven't done so um, either. And I mean, yeah, you know, I think. Uh, it's it's a tricky thing. It's it is. I think it's kind of about striking that balance between obviously uh, a world that's being more and more interconnected and uh, having ways to manage that interconnectedness, but at the same time recognizing uh, that kind of local uh, contextual situations matter and that they really really need to 
uh, plan for them and we really need to have uh, the means to to manage them. Yeah, you know, I've, I, I mean, I, I have been more Eurosceptic than most of my peers and most of my colleagues um, always throughout. I mean, of course, I, I, I voted on the referendum I voted for uh, joining the the Europe because I think it's still better than and it's not. But but it was exactly those economic arguments that resonated well, very well with me. I, I was a business major as an undergrad, and that was between 1997 and 2001. And uh, I spent a summer at Oxford and uh, at Mansfield College, and we had an economist who was a uh, um, like a former Thatcher advisor of some probably lower level, um, who who was who was teaching our classes and uh, and the arguments, the Eurosceptic arguments that he laid out to us uh, from a purely economic point of view, specifically citing these ideas of of uh, of you cannot take away the the monetary policy from the countries because then they will not be able to deal with the boom bust cycles very much resonated with me afterwards and maybe this euro thing is not a good idea whereas if you look at the countries like hungary where i'm from uh was was uh, was looking at the euro as the savior thing that uh, you know this comes this will be great and probably Greece looked at the euro the same way and Italy looked at the euro that if we got our shitty currency and now we're going to get a good currency and they suffered horribly <laughs> for for yeah. for uh, for signing up and and jumping on board uh because they lost the tools to manage crises and uh, the solidarity in Europe is certainly not was not there for for the stronger economy specifically Germany to to, to bail them out, quite the contrary, just the suggestion of it has uh, has gave has given rise to the AfD to some extent. Was, I mean, it wasn't only that, but it but it's definitely related, uh, which is very Eurosceptic and uh, very xenophobic and uh, and etc. So um, so yeah, so let's try to square that circle. Yeah, I mean the thing is. You know, I I don't want to make it sound like, you know, we think the national governments are these geniuses who, you know, uh, would, would, would create better economic policies. But the thing is, you know, it, it has more flexibility. You know, you get yeah, exactly. to perhaps I vote about the people better. in that, that, yeah. that would fix the things. And if, if they don't even have the possibility to do that, then it's tricky. Right, like there, there's really nothing to do if the power to to change certain things is not even in 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 your own country, but it's it's somewhere else. Yeah. Well, okay. So uh, more power to national governments is one fix. Any other ones? I mean, uh, um, it, it's clear, there's a clear suggestion that we need a very strong welfare state that is going to automatically deal with these problems without special arrangement. And it's definitely one that was that was mentioned. Um, giving more power to labor was definitely mentioned, though I'm, um, I mean, I'm a bit skeptical. Like if you have very strong unions and you demand high wages because of that, then, um, well, that, that that is just going to increase the, the exportation of labor to 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 China and not decrease. So I'm a little bit skeptical of of, of that as a solution. But uh, I don't know. I mean, one else? thing that yeah. one thing is like when designing these, you know, trade agreements, when designing all of these liberal, you know, um, trade reforms. More attention needs to be given to the needs of the kind of like the labor rather than the needs of the of the capital. I definitely think capital is at the forefront of, you know, when when these things are being thought of and written down and and devised. I think, but mostly what people care about is the needs of the capital, and I think some of that, you know, that needs to shift uh, towards. All right, let's look at what what the labor needs because there's you know there's clearly been uh not enough attention paid uh paid to that uh 
and I think in the end, it's trying to focus on 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 industries and areas, economic areas where uh, there's more to gain. Uh, perhaps certain industries where there's just untapped potential where trade liberalization could actually uh, perhaps increase the pie rather than on areas where we're kind of already pushed it almost to the limit and anything anything we liberalize further is just not going to give as much uh, of a of a of a return to the society and then system as, as a whole I think yeah and in, in a way, the current system is that still of, you know, trickle down economics, you know, uh, we have to first take care of the capital and, you know, the benefits will, will trickle down to, uh, to the rest, but that needs to be retaught. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it's very funny because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm trying to think of my, you know, friends who are Trump supporters and, uh, and, you know, when you talk about the needs of the capital and the labor, you sound like a Marxist. So that would not resonate whatsoever with them. But <laughs> at, at, at the same time, when we talk about well, what we're talking about really is, is the capital will export, uh, export your jobs to China. That will very much resonate with them. When we mentioned that we need po more power to the nationalist government or, or the, or the, the national governments that they will certainly like, but, uh, there's some other arguments here that uh, they probably wouldn't. I might just send this to one of them and ask uh, ask what he, what he thinks. Uh, so I mean, it's it's it it is really a difficult conversation that is going to require nuanced solutions, and those are not the easiest to sell politically. Let's <laughs> let's say, yeah. and maybe that is the success of populists that you know arguments like let's build a wall on on the border of Mexico are. Are the ones that work. Yeah, I, I think you beautifully summarized this this whole discussion with this because you know these these certain anxieties, these certain things that everyone notices are happening because of globalization and trade liberalization and financial liberalization are there, and you can frame them in a variety of ways. You know, you can frame them as needs of the capital, needs of the labor, or you can frame them as look. If we don't address this, your jobs are going to go somewhere else. And it's just up to those uh, politicians on the demand side that, you know, they just look at it and I guess they decide it's easier for me to do this if I want to get votes rather than to do this. And yeah. that, that's what happens. <laughs> yeah. Well, on that note, I think we should hit stop. And uh, thanks, yeah. everybody, for watching. Yeah. Thank you all very much. Bye, everyone. Bye.